Hello, everyone. I'm super excited to have you all back into show again. Today, we're going to go a little bit deeper into the world of mergers and acquisitions in Latin America. A lot of people who have not sold their companies or not have been part of the acquisition team have no idea what is really going on in the world of M&A. So today, we're going to have two very great guests uh, from an international network that is basically handling M&As all around the world. One of the guests is from Brazil and the other one from Argentina. And just to give a little glimpse of the volumes, what are happening in terms of M&A, only in Brazil in 22, there was 1,600 M&A deals that were conducted. So Bautista, who do we have in the show for today's very intriguing episode? Yeah, we're going to have Pablo Teuval from FS Partners uh, from Argentina. And then we're going to have Marcio Fusa from Brazil Par from Sao Paulo, Brazil. So, you know, let's get into it. Welcome to the Find the Way podcast. In this show, we will try to explore what is happening in emerging markets and how entrepreneurs, investors, and communities are simply finding the way to make phenomenal things happen, regardless how volatile the environment may sometimes seem. And uh, Pablo and Marcio, how do you know each other? Uh, we and, and to Marcio, for you, we met Pablo um, now already in, in August. We went to to his offices. Uh, was able to get a little glimpse of 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 what is IMAP, who you are, the incredible work that you're putting putting together. Um, but how do through that you know each other, or have you long? Is there a longer story? No, basically, uh, I don't know when you joined IMAP, Marcio. In what year? I think it was 2014. Okay, we joined. I think it was 2010, and uh, we we met we met there. We, we tried doing some deals together and uh, that's how you, that's how, how I'm, I'm at works, you know, I'm at, it's a, it's a, it's a real global partnership, you know, uh, and, and we, we work together with 49. Now we have 49 different countries, 49 different of offices in different countries. And, uh, we basically work together. Uh, in deals that uh, we, 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 we do some, we exchange deals together, you know, and uh, that's how I met Marcio and all his partners. How does this yeah. working together actually work in reality, Pablo or, and Marcio as well? Do you pick up the phone and you say, Hey, Marcio, I have this company or is there some transactional information ongoing? Uh, how does that look in reality? Actually, there are many ways that we collaborate at IMAP, um, one of them, which is not actually the most uh, efficient in the sense that it's a conference. We have two conferences uh, each year. Uh, at those conferences, we exchange opportunities. So basically, we, we present uh, the mandates we have, and our partners help, for example, identify uh, potential buyers. Some of these names are non-obvious names uh, because, you know, sometimes we identify that uh, a large multinational company is the natural buyer of a certain company here. Uh, but sometimes it's a local company that's not well known uh, for us, but the, our local partners, for example, in Germany, Italy, France, or in, even the US, they, they know those, those uh, potential buyers and they suggest those names for, to us. So that's one way we collaborate, but obviously it's not ideal because we have only two conferences per year and the transactions cannot wait until we have the conference. So the conferences are really an opportunity to exchange whatever we have currently on our pipeline. But most of the time, uh, we exchange ideas, you know, through phones or through email. Basically, we call, we can call Pablo and say, Pablo, we, we have an idea here. We Maybe we can talk to this company or that company and, and, and pitch a, a transaction. And that's obviously works much better uh, than uh, going to the conferences, but that only works because we know Pablo and we know him through a conference and 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 through some transactions we we try to do together. And another another way of doing of looking at this is, for example, we we closed a mining deal in 2020, and uh, we don't know nothing about mining, but uh, in 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 IMAP we we do have. Many of our partners have different type of expertise. For example, we, we called the Canadians because we knew that they had mining experience and we had a great 
great experience with them and we sold the company together. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And from there is like pretty natural. It would be great to hear a little bit of your thoughts. Um, you mentioned that the game is not for amateurs, for, sh for sure, at least in Brazil. The game is for dreamers in Argentina and, mm -hmm. and we've seen that throughout now the past couple hundred years. It's been, people have been moving um, towards the West from, from, from Europe to chase their dreams. But what has been now going on in, in terms of an M&A in, in the region? There's not a lot of information unless you're part of these networks. There's a lot of activities that are happening. According to the IMAB, if I have all the latest stats already in Brazil by itself, in 22, there were 1,600 deals that were closed. Those are phenomenal numbers. So there's a lot of activity. So what is overall happening? Are you able to share a little bit to the audience that the state of mergers and acquisitions, is there activity? Uh, what has been happening? You've been playing the game for quite a while. Um, overall, the thoughts, what, what, what's going on? Oh, Bra Brazil is uh, a very complex market. It's usually an inbound market meaning uh, there's more interest in people investing in Brazil than the Brazilian companies investing abroad. Usually, uh, Brazilian companies only consider M&A when all the opportunities are exhausted in their home market. Uh, as yeah. an example for Itaú, uh, which is the largest bank in Brazil, it started looking abroad when uh, our antitrust authority didn't allow, allow it to continue acquiring more banks. Uh, and yeah. there was already too much concentration in the home market. So it's usually an inbound market. Uh, but it, it's, it's because of its size, as you said, there are, there's a lot of transactions. Um, uh, you, you, have, you have a right number there. Um, but it's, uh, it's also very competitive. All the major players are in Brazil. So all the investment bulge bracket firms uh, have offices or operations here in Brazil. Um, so Morgan Stanley, Goldman, uh, JP Morgan, all of them. Uh, and also the large commercial banks like Itaú, Bradesco, Santander, they all have investment bank operations. BTG is, uh, is also a big player. They, they are players in, in other countries in Latin America as well. So we, uh, and there's there are a lot of boutiques, so M and A boutiques like Brazil Par, uh, which are comprised of uh, several partners which have market experience in large banks, most of them abroad, and we decided to to go independent and 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 to provide that kind of service to to mid middle market clients. So that's more or less the dynamic of the market. So. We try to punch above our our eight weight uh, to get larger transactions, but it's a very competitive market. And sometimes we, uh, once we cross a certain line in terms of size, then we start to compete against banks. And how many, let's say, M and A boutiques and overall people who are dealing with the M and A in Brazil? Do you have any ballpark estimate that how how many? You said it's very competitive. And I understand, but but it's very hard to grasp um, how many players are competing for 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 providing these services. Uh, I, I would say that relevant players, we have more than fifteen boutiques. Fifteen boutiques. Yeah, but obviously there are smaller players which are not well known, and sometimes they are uh, just being established. Like for example, sometimes uh, it's a very common dynamic. Like uh, you you make your career in a large bank. Uh, and at certain point, you, you leave, you're tired of the long hours and you decide to, to set up your own shop. So basically, some people have their relationships fresh. They have advised some clients in a certain industry. They, they think uh, they, they are good at a certain uh, type of industry, for example. They decide to set up their own shop. And, and so there is always news of new m and boutiques popping up. So it's a very competitive market. But Brazil Park, for example, has been around since 1976. So basically, we are uh, probably the longest standing M&A boutique in Brazil. Uh, not usually at the same format, not, not uh, all the time at the same format, but uh, we, we are probably the longest standing one. So you're doing something right. You've been there for, for quite a while. So the, yeah. you know, the clients must like what you're doing. So it's not you not being just... 
it's a reputation of of uh, ethics and 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 also you know excellence in execution right absolutely and then pablo how 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 would you describe then what is happening in argentina argentina has been especially in in the recent years a lot more volatile and you're just a true survivor um fixing deals and and still playing the game in argentina how would you describe then what what, what has been going on in argentina well um Regarding M&A activity, you mean M&A activity is, is extremely modest today, um, both in number of deals and in, and in volume. Uh, and it's obvious because there is, there's, a, there's limited inbound of foreign investment because there are so many controls that uh, nobody w- would like to come to put their money in Argentina when the, number one, there are different types of foreign exchange uh, that uh, are completely crazy. Uh, and number two, uh, you won't be able to take your money back with, 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 today, with today's regulations. You know? Number two, there's uncertain, also there's a, a, a completely uncertain economic and political environment that uh, uh, all, the, the only deals that today happen are uh, maybe in the energy sector, maybe in, in the tech sector that work for outside, for outside the country, but uh, otherwise it is very, very limited. And how has it been, let's say the huge boom years of the nineties, um, going after the huge crisis of 01 in Argentina, and then how has the M and A activity been, um, in between then these multiple different crises that you've been going through, you've had this huge, you know, growth periods where everybody's been hailing Argentina and then just huge busts when everybody's getting out of Argentina. Well, what, right. what has been happening historically? You, you still have a boutique well, shop in Argentina. So then yeah, you've been yeah, able we, to survive at, at the end of the day. Um, actually, up to 2005, I was in the private equity business. So hmm. I was scouting for, for businesses and, for, and, and looking at tremendous amount of, of companies. And, in Argentina uh, specifically. In Argentina specifically, yeah. also a little bit in Brazil and Chile. Um, so, so I was on the other on, on the other side. I was looking for companies and not looking for advisory or to, to advise companies. And um, that was a boom. Uh, boutiques flourished. Uh, deals uh, were uh, big. There were the privatizations also in the '90s. So everybody was happy there. Uh, after the crisis, it was a lot more difficult, but still there was like one rate of exchange and also the devaluation made uh, companies very cheap in Argentina. So after the, the 2001 crisis, also it was a, a real boom up to two years after that, for example, in 2003, 2004, uh, because the, the, the prices of, of companies, the valuations were very low. Uh, because basically because of the evaluation and, and yeah. uh, local companies started being competitive at that at, at those FX rates. You know? um, and uh, after that, well, I think you know the story. Uh, uh, basically, a lot of government spending, a lot of fiscal deficit, a lot of, I would say, uh, populism and... Uh, that inevitably, when you print money, turns into into inflation, and that's where we are now, you no, know, facing a, a very very difficult times. Do you think the amount of deals should increase now, given the decrease in valuations, not only worldwide but also in Argentina? I suspect that valuations are going down more than they are going. Wrong. Do you think the number of deals should increase if the environment, the uncertainty? eventually drops, I'm sure there will be a, no, a lot of M&A activity in Argentina. Maybe mainly in the natural resources, in energy, in tech, in agribusiness as usual, but also in other, in other, in other sectors of, of, of the economy that might uh, uh, wake up. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And then basically for both of you, Marcio and Pablo, in a way that um, the deals that you're conducting, are they mainly towards, let's say, traditional SMEs with the very 
let's say steady and 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 long history and, and <clears throat> steady growth or are you seeing now more and more tech companies especially in brazil and argentina what we are personally uh, with Bautista very optimistic is about the tech sector is there is a lot of technology has been developed um that is the only one of the greatest ways sorry to get out of um pesos in in argentina for especially is to provide software services around the world those companies are booming pablo we know at least one deal that you've been involved um tech entrepreneurs and so an overall pablo and marcio like how do you see the tech sector are, are you handling deals over there or is it more traditional smes that you're you're dealing with we might have very different uh, scenarios with marcio you know marcio if you want you can start uh, uh, sure or i will start yeah go ahead uh, in, in 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 argentina definitely the tech sector is 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 great because we have a, some competitive advantages number one the time zone where the us for example number two the cost of 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 resources here the level of english of people here uh, maybe some education is falling but it's still there um and um, also uh, the you know working in such a difficult environment um, it's like it it allows entrepreneurs to once you have dealt with so such difficult environments starting up a company you know it's it's like piece of cake you know, i would say we have very good entrepreneurs because of exactly because of that because they they've been dealing with regulations etc and 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 uh, they are very uh, capable of of doing big things and and of of uh, dreaming dreaming high or dreaming big uh, and uh, all these startups that we see someday you know grow and someday will be acquired or be sold and and that's where we are. We we did a, a tech. Uh, we did three or four tech deals in our lifetime, and uh, we are you know prospecting some more uh, now actually uh, because this is a uh, an industry that works for for outside of Argentina mainly, and that uh, simplifies a lot the the operation. El Pablo, here I and, I noticed that uh, so far in the year, uh, IMAP has at least fifteen percent of the deals are from technology. Do you think that in Argentina that is a bigger number compared to the overall IMAP scale, landscape? You know, it's very as as uh, Eric mentioned before, the data on the deals is very scarce, and I I, I wouldn't be able to to affirm or deny that. Yeah. But on, on the Brazil side here, the tech sector is very strong. Uh, obviously, uh, it's a function of the sophistication of the financial systems also in Brazil. As you know, we had a hyperinflation many, many years uh, ago. And because of that, banks became very sophisticated technically uh, and especially on their IT function. And because of that, the, the Brazilian financial system is is way ahead of many of comparing to many other countries. Because of and that, when did this transformation start? Um, that they started. When was this again for the audience that are not from Latin America and might not know the history of Brazil? When were this uh, transition? The, 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 the big began? transition actually came with the Real Plan when we had some stability on 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 the on the currency. But before that, when there was hyperinflation and there were several different uh, heterodox economic plans, uh, the banks w were very sophisticated because they had they basically deal with information and money, and they had to to be very agile and 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 in order to survive in that kind of environment. So basically, they what years. Uh, hyperinflation, uh, you know, inflation accelerated after the, I would say, the first and the second oil crisis, 73, 78, 79. And we had from, from that period until 94, we had different periods of, of accelerating inflation and, and the economy was all indexed. So basically you had several inflation indexes correcting contracts and everything else. 
So because of that, banks and, 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 and also supermarkets made a lot of money because they, they received cash and paid, you know, with credit. Uh, but because of that, the, the Brazilian, you know, financial system is very sophisticated. Uh, for example, we have things here that probably are not very common in other countries like, uh, 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 you know, immediate transfer of funds. So basically you send some money to some a money to somebody, uh, it gets immediately at their bank account. It's not something that needs to be compensated overnight. And we have a, a system called PIX, which is, you know, based on your cell phone number. Uh, which is also immediate, uh, and it, that, that includes a lot of people that do not have access to, to bank accounts. But that creates a whole environment, and also the fact that we have uh, all the, the, the you know, venture funds, venture capital funds operate in Brazil. For example, Monashis, Kazakh Capital, etc. They all have operations here, and and they help the entrepreneurs, especially in fintech, and but other techs as well to to develop their businesses and so it's a very um prolific in terms of uh, very uh, yeah optimal uh, environment for for entrepreneurs in brazil and have you been dealing now transactions within this sector uh within higher growth companies and technology yeah we in, we, in your boutique? we we have uh, uh, nowadays we have uh uh mandate mandate in uh Health Tech, which uh, is a company that has, uh, it's not a, a real startup in the sense that it's, it's a business that was developed within a big organization, a big traditional organization, but they, they realized that they need to let this, uh, this uh, health tech uh, uh, be alone and, and, and grow by itself because of uh, the, their capital needs and also the, the fact that the market is moving quickly. So we are in a very early stage of, of a similar situation of, 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 of a health tech. But uh, I would say that uh, th there's a challenge for us as M&A boutiques because tech is obviously a very important sector. If you look at the statistics, you're going to see that they represent a significant portion of what's going on. But if you look at Brazil specifically, uh, out of those uh, 1,600 transactions that you saw, you mentioned uh, about 400 or 500 of them are venture, because that that that, mm -hmm. that statistic includes everything, it includes M and A, sell side, yep. buy side, asset sales. Uh, but about 400 of them are venture capital transactions. But if you look at the average size, I think, uh, for example. If I'm mistaken, the average size for venture capital is about six million dollars, while the M&A transactions, the average size is more like uh, twenty-six million dollars, and PE transactions, which are private equity funds, is more towards like fifty million dollars. So you can see that there's a, a huge difference in terms of size. And for us, which we are boutiques, we usually work with sort of minimum fees, that kind of make it difficult for us to penetrate the venture capital segment. Uh, and there are also other differences because in general, if you look at how business is done in the venture segment, sometimes entrepreneurs, especially when they are at the very early stage of their, their, their path, they, they can get funding just by pitching uh, like with a very slim deck. They just say, okay, here's mm -hmm. a problem. Here's how we plan to, to make a solution for that. Here's the technology that we are going to be using. And sometimes that's enough to, to lure the, the venture capital funds into you know, funding their, their, their venture. Um, so it's completely different from the M&A world, which is you have to really go through a lot of uh, projections and, and data and trying to to convince uh, very, very hard investors, smart investors, uh, like private equity funds to invest in that company, for example. So it's a, it's a completely different game. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And then basically, when we go to the valuations 
of those deals, you were basically giving that roughly six million for VC, for SMEs, roughly twenty five million in private equity, fifty million plus in Brazil. Um, first, Pablo, are those similar numbers in Argentina? What are you witnessing, especially now if you work with more on tech on the VC side, uh, the private equity and SMEs more slow and slow for for the time being. But would you say that those numbers have been um, more or less the same in Argentina? Um, yeah, they might be similar, but uh, what happens? What happened in Argentina, for example, there was this one company that got sold for you know for a unicorn for one thousand one. One billion, so that is like it distorts in in such a short amount of deals. Yeah, uh, that distorts everything. No, one year it can be like that, and the other one very different. But uh, uh, we might be similar, similar than Marcio mentioned. What I think is that in Argentina, regarding specifically the MA market. The mid, the uh, what we call the the mid-sized transactions. The mid-sized transactions are defined as lower than five hundred million. Okay, higher than five hundred million is like Marcio said. They usually are taken by big banks. Uh, but in in the case of of us, our boutique, we do deals between five and fifty. Marcio might do deals between fifty. I don't know, fifty and five hundred. You know, it's it's, yeah. it's a very it's, it's a very different uh, scale in that sense, what we see in Argentina and what we see in, in, in other countries. Uh, it's not, not worse or better. No? In Sweden, they might have numbers similar as ours, but in, in yeah. other countries, it, that changes a lot. And Marisa, you had about 25 million to what? Yeah, our sweet spot is really from 25 million, 20 million, uh, which is kind of the minimum, until 100 million dollars. That's the sweet sweet spot. Doesn't mean that we don't think it's above that. The higher limit is really given by the competition with the big banks. And for example, we did a transaction I did um, uh, many years ago, which was a uh, power transmission line. It was 900 million dollars. Right as a boutique, and then we did that transaction. Yep. It's just a matter of you know having the right re relationship and and being the first at the door and and having the the right approach. Uh, but those transactions re really come up like every two three years. It's not something very common for a boutique. So that's that's why our, our sweet spot is really because most of our transactions are within that range of twenty to a hundred million dollars couple of those 900 million deals more and then you don't need to go through the concrete <laughs> jungle of Sao Paulo anymore. You're going to fly around on those helicopters because this is, this is what you need in Sao Paulo. You got to make some cash because otherwise you're going to be stuck in traffic yeah, all of no, your no, life no, don't... and not, you know, your quality of life decreases so dramatically. It's The ones who have been in Sao Paulo, it's like, it, it, it's nuts. It's one of the most craziest traffics where you go through and you spend your life in a car. That's why you got to make big deals. Yeah, so you can don't, fly around. Don't, don't forget that we have to pay our team and, and they, they, anybody here can work in any investment bank. So basically we have to be competitive in the, in the bonus packages. <laughs> But the bonus package could include, think about the ability for you to retain talent is that, hey, we've done so many great deals that we're going to have like a company helicopter that picks you up and takes you to the office <laughs> if you're not fully remote. I would love that. That would be actually pretty damn cool of an of a incentive for people to join. Yeah. Think about the junior analyst who comes right out of college and says, hey, Marcio comes in. Hey, join us. Do not go for Itao, Goldman, or JB. Just come with us and you have a helicopter ride back and forth from work. Yeah, at first time, time sharing. That's a right? great idea, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> and Bubble, yeah. you know, you've been in Sao Paulo. Yeah. It's like you cannot, you cannot sit in those yeah. cars. Something needs to change. Somebody needs to create hyperloop network, underground networks that people cannot sit that many hours in a car. Somebody needs to come and fix that. Or you move it's closer to the office, right? Which is what I did. Oh, true, <laughs> true. That is also, but then when you need to go anywhere else to meet up with a client, it's going to, goodness. Uh, Faster to go to Buenos Aires from Sao Paulo than 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 going across the city. That's true. <laughs> then, if we take a little bit of look on on where are these buyers now coming from, and what are you now witnessing? There is a lot of literature and a lot of arguments. You know, M and A. Most of the deals do not really function. It's, the integrations can be very tough and very bad. Still, people are buying. They go company shopping. 
they keep buying. And there was one example on your IMAB magazine of a one um, company from Bilbao. They had made over 100 different acquisitions. I don't remember, recall the company name anymore. And then the acquisition strategy looks as so, and they, they've been, they still keep doing it. It seems to go relatively well. But then at the same time, you look at Harvard Business Review, any type of magazine, any type of literature, everybody says M&A hardly ever works. I still keep, people keep buying. What, what, what's, what's your thoughts on this? Actually, McKinsey has written a lot about that, and, and I think they, their thesis is that what works best for m and is what they call programmatic m and which is doing a lot of smaller transactions instead of doing a big transformational transaction. Mm. Because big transformational transactions obviously carry more risk, and, and, and there are many reasons why uh, an m and transaction can go wrong either before it closes or after it closes, because it's, we're dealing with co complex things. We're dealing with companies, with cultures, with people, systems. Uh, and, and because of that, I think if a company has a programmatic M&A, which is uh, they understand where they need to grow, what kind of skills they need to acquire, and they're doing acquisitions frequently, they tend to be more successful in their processes. Absolutely. And how is that being perceived by your clients? Do they see that uh, the M&A consultants trying to get more fees or do they see value on the services that you're providing? No, no, this is, this is not for a fee. It's part of the service. So it's part provide. of the whole package. Oh, oh yeah. Um, at least in my experience, it was like yeah. that. We can also get into 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 different mandates of, of specifically integration, but uh, that was not my case, uh, at least. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, M&A is not a, it's not a simple process. No, it's a very complex process that involves people, which is the most complex thing mm -hmm. of all. <laughs> and uh, um, it's not putting a, you know, getting a newspaper and selling a car. No, it's, it's, it's very, very complex. It's very, very long. Sometimes the relationship that you build up with, uh, with your clients stays on for years until you can effectively sell the company and, and, and get, and get the fees. No. So it's, it's an investment that we do every day, talking for to them, long understanding the problematics. And, and eventually it matures and eventually not. And th th then basically now regarding your M&A process, I, I think that a lot of, lot of people in the audience, there is, um, is, is there anything different when you're dealing up with the M&A process here in Latin America uh, that people uh, and folks have been used to doing in the US or Europe or going towards uh, Asia? How would, you know, you say that this is very complex, but what does that really mean? Would you be able to shed a light a little bit and open the doors? Let's say if now there is an, 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 an I'm a, a German industrial company, I have certain needs in terms of software, technology, even let's say hardware facilities that I would need. What, 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 what can you do and how would the process look like? Would you be able to open up a little bit on the, 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 the doors into what, does this complexity really mean? Uh, I know it's a super yeah. tough question, but yeah, I like it. it's, it's, uh, actually, it's a very uh, big and large question. Actually, there are many questions within your your questions. I'll, I'll start by 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 uh, shedding a little bit of light where, uh, about the differences in terms of uh, M and A here and 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 in other countries, including the U.S., which I had some experience. Uh, for example. If you deal with family-owned companies in Brazil, uh, they are not very sophisticated. Some of them are, some of them are not. Uh, so, for example, when you are retained by a client, you, one of the questions we do is, do you have long-term projections? Uh, so basically, and most of the time, the answer is no, which means the company has a budget for next year, not something like five years out or 10 years out. And that's a big difference. Mm -hmm. For example, I remember uh, working in, in, in the U.S. and, and I, I was assigned to a deal. And the first thing I got was, okay, we are going to be merging these two companies. Here are the projections of the two companies. Just 
try to understand what happens in terms of accretion, dilution of shares and, 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 and possible financing alternatives. You go straight to the more uh, uh, sophisticated part of the deal. Here, when we are retained by a family-owned company, and if the company doesn't have long-term projection, and long-term here could be just five years, uh, what happens is we're going to have to sit with them because the, one of the main methodologies to, to value a company is really discounted cash flow. There are others, but the main one is discounted cash flow. So you have to sit with them and have to develop projections. And basically, we have to engage uh -huh. with them in terms of asking questions. Okay, which product line are, is going to grow faster? Okay, well, how is the price behavior? Are you able to pass through inflation? Is it linked to the dollar or not? How is your cost uh, fluctuating or is, how is it going to be fluctuating in the future? Is it linked to something or not? And with that, we have to, how is your competitive environment? Which are, what are your competitors doing which may be pressing down your price or not? So we have to get into those discussions about business plan and that takes a lot of time uh, in order true, for us to develop true. projections. An example of this in, 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 in most countries in Europe, for what we've seen, you can close a deal in six to nine months. Uh, my experience in Argentina, it cannot take less than 1.5 years. And that's if it's, you know, everything runs running smooth. Because also, um, due diligences here are much difficult. We have a lot of different taxes, a lot of different regulations, a lot of contingencies mm. to be seen and to be explored. Uh, unfortunately, these, these systems, and I think it's very similar in Brazil, no? yes. they, they have the same, same things there. And that takes a lot of time, a lot of discussions with the potential buyer or the potential seller. A lot of negotiations in that sense regarding what we're going to do if this contingency arises or not. Yeah. A lot of discussions regarding the escrow amount, how much we will need to leave in, in as a guarantee or not. You know, you name it, but uh, that's part of the complexities that we suffer in, in, in LATAM in general. And, and, and on this side, because this is very important, and thanks for sharing in a way that the, the, the length of the deals, the nuances and the complexities that may come when it comes to due, due diligence, especially, and, and just a simple realization that if, if I come from Europe, I'm from Finland, I come to Brazil, um, I come to Argentina, we're just group animals and we fear things that we do not understand or we do not know, then building that trust takes such a long time. From there comes to the point is that if, for instance, you know, Marcio and Pablo, you mentioned that there were most of the things have been inbound, especially now in, in Brazil, not so much currently in Argentina because of the, of the current status of the county. But traditionally, it's inbound. Also. Traditionally, it's inbound, yes. Um, how much does it cost? Let's say we talk, you don't need to mention about your fees, but, but like overall for the buyer, I'm a German or a Dutch company, I, I, I'm coming in to do a little shopping in the IoT sector of or active sector of Brazil or Argentina. The budget is at somewhere, let's say the deal value would be roughly $50 million. Or how much goes into actually, how many dollars go into getting this deal done? If it's going to take like a year plus, year and a half, all the nuances, what would you say that is, how much is it going to cost? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough a, a tough one because there's no guidelines here, but of course you will need, at least you need accountants from both sides and you will, you will need lawyers from both sides and you will need us from both sides. Okay. So basically it's, 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 it's three components of, of, of cost that the buyer or seller will need to, to, to have, uh, um, it's difficult to put price on that because it depends on the size of the transaction. It depends on the hour that you, hours that you spend. It depends on how, how well ordered is the company that you are going to acquire or not, if it's public or not, is it, if it's big or if it's small, if it has the, the uh, uh, projections that Marshall mentioned or not, you know, it's very, very tailored made for each project. 
budget. And, and our, what we do is exactly that, you know, try to assemble all these machines so that it flows and you talk to the lawyers, you talk to the accountants, you talk to your client, you talk to everybody and you try to, uh, uh work with those variables all together. And, and the lawyers will keep you there forever. They he will keep you there forever. And then when you look at the Brazilians, it's like everybody's graduating as a lawyer. Yeah. And it's like we've had this conversation with multiple tech entrepreneurs in Brazil is that people should become a lawyer because they're making a very good amount of Benjamins. The dollars are keep coming into your pocket and they will sell their services forever. So then it's like, of course, it's like uh, the, 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 dealing with that is super, super difficult and, and nuanced. And we understand the complexities. But then it's like, because of these complexities, like let's say, let's take an example, $25 million deal that somebody like from the Netherlands wants to come to Brazil and wants to do a little shopping in, in, in from agriculture technology company. The budget is roughly 25 million. Uh, now we're talking about a year of process ongoing. We have accountants, lawyers, and advisors like yourself in, in the deal. How much approximately, let's say the wild ballpark estimate that you had to spend? I would say roughly perhaps two to 3% for the financial advisor only on one side. Obviously, the other side probably will spend a similar amount. Um, I would say probably like uh, 50 to 100 US dollars for lawyers on one each side. Each side or one each side? side? Each side. side yeah. yeah. And a, li a little less than that for the auditors. So it, it, at the end of the day, it's probably will build up to something probably above 5% of the overall transaction value at that particular size. Obviously, you have to take into account that the larger the transaction, the lower the percentage for the, specifically for the financial advisor, because uh, the way the logic of our markets work is if we are doing a very small transaction, we have a sort of a minimal fee that we want to receive. So it may range, I would say, from 5% at the top level to if it's a very large transaction, probably we will charge something very small, perhaps 1%, perhaps 75 basis points if it's a very large one. So it's, it's, a, it's a situation where the larger the transaction, the smaller the percentage, but the higher the absolute amount that we're getting uh, because it's a large transaction. That's for the financial advisors. On the legal side, uh, obviously, and the lawyers charge by the hour, right? And, and that's something that we advise our clients to, to do, which is sometimes lawyers want to have a success fee as well. And we, uh -huh. we, we tend to tell them that it's better to hire the lawyers by the hour because you want to have someone that's not incentivized to, 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 to tell you to close the deal to close when there is a risk, actually. So the lawyers earning by the hour, it's a, it's a good thing because they are not incentivized to close the deal. They are just working, you know, whatever is necessary for, to, to protect. To get done. Yeah, and yeah. to protect the, the client for, from the risks and liabilities that it may be assuming. Uh, so in that sense, uh, the, the remuneration of the lawyers doesn't grow exactly uh, linearly with, with, with the size of the deal. But at the end of the day, if you're doing a large transaction, you are retaining a top five firm, a lawyer firm, law firm. So basically you're paying more by the hour. So it becomes more expensive yeah, it's there. Super expensive, $700 an hour to look at documents that they're going to put an associate to go through. So then it's like... And, and, and keep in mind that for M&A transactions, you, you're going to have lawyers which are specialized in labor, uh, taxes, yeah. uh, antitrust, uh, social situations like, for example, the, the shareholders agreement, things like that. So uh, environmental, don't, don't forget environmental. So basically, you're going to have many billing hours for different uh, uh, specialties of law. And do you see that normally, like he, like in, in Latin America over here, um, both sides, the buyer um, and the seller, pays equal amount of fees? Or do there most often there is maybe deals that, hey, once the transaction is completed, then other party takes most of it? Or what is the standard? Uh, if it's a multinational 
uh, the, the multinational cannot preclude from hiring uh, you know, the best lawyers and having a lawyer, an auditor, and a financial advisor usually. Uh, on the other side, if you're talking about family-owned companies, sometimes they go without the auditor. They just use their internal accountants, uh, right. and but they use they have to hire an external legal counsel because we we do not advise anybody or any company to get involved in an M&A transaction with your regular lawyer. You have to retain yeah. an, a lawyer that specialized in M&A, and if they uh, you know and they need to necessarily to hire a financial advisor because sometimes they are selling the business that was built three generations ago, founded by the grandparent uh, and selling the business of their family. And, and it's very important to have something or someone that knows what what they are doing uh, in a very important strategic point, which is selling the business of, of their family. And what are you seeing then from the approaches from the buyers? So the buyers are coming in and they, they might contact you through your networks that you have. And then ultimately, you know that, hey, we have these companies. And, and do you go then to the entrepreneurs, the family offices, family businesses and say, hey, you want to be millionaires? Or how do you, <laughs> how does, the, how does the, um, the process go in a way is that because the world of M&A is, is very untransparent for a lot of the things that we are used to seeing in, in, in most, of, most of the business cases today. So M&A is like a, this big fascination that nobody really knows unless they're in the game. So would you be able to describe a little bit on, on what, you know, you're building up these relationships for years to come. Now, Pablo, for, for instance, know uh, together with Bautista, this, this company that you helped to, to sell their previous, previous business to Mercado Libre, and now they started a new company, and there Pablo is building up the relationships all along to be ready for the next exit. And, and, and then it's like, this is, it's very logical. But how, how do you, what is happening in terms of the, the, the buyers are coming in, they come to you or they come to the company. And then how does the, how do you, do you have to sell this many of the times to the entrepreneur? One more question here. Is it, are they, are they on the buyer side or are you actually it's more on the sell side? So you're, are you looking at who can yeah. buy these? Because that could be the case as well. Mm -hmm. Correct. Exactly. Basically, I, sorry to to make this simple for what you say. You think it's very complex, but we basically have either sell side or buy side mandates. You know? And most of our mandates are sell side. So okay. our people or companies will, willing to sell their businesses. We do have eventually some buy side mandates, um, which are... Um, uh, uh, which are, you know, they will pay you if you find them something to buy. And that's a little bit more difficult than, uh, because they, they can, you know, you work two years finding targets for, for this company. And all of a sudden say, no, I don't like this one because it's a little bit, I don't know that I don't yeah. like the part or whatever. And you end up doing nothing. So buy size are a little bit more difficult than sell size usually. Um, but we do have some opportunities, opportunities in the buy side also. Yeah. He, he, here we are typically, I would say, more sell sides than buy sides. But for example, last year we had, uh, we closed five transactions of which three were buy sides and multinationals <laughs> buying into Brazil. Uh, and, and the way it works, just perhaps to, to shed a little bit of light, there are two big different alternatives here for the buy side. Sometimes we get, uh, we are contacted by multinationals that want to buy a certain type of company. Uh, and, and, and they basically gives us, they give, give us a briefing, basically, okay, we want to buy a, a bio inoculant business in Brazil. Uh, okay, what's a bio inoculant uh, to begin with, right? So, and then they sort of explain what's the product and what's like. And we then we, we start to look at what are the companies that operate in that particular segment. And once we are mandated, then we, we start, you know, digging more heavily in terms of information and we identify, make a profile of these companies. And, and, and sometimes we 
most of the time we visit the companies and we approach them and we talk to the owners, we talk to the management, and we try to understand because there is a lot of information which is not public, right? You need to understand what's the shareholding structure, uh, which sometimes is public, but you need to understand if it's a third generation company, if there is any tension between sides of the family, if perhaps they wanna, they don't have succession, they have a reason to sell. Uh, and, and once we go back to our client, we kind of present them, okay, we have these five companies here that we identified and, and the client goes, okay, I don't like this one because it's basically only a marketing company. This one has research. I like that. This one has good distribution, also important for me. So basically we tend to narrow down to a short list of potential targets and then we try to engage them in an M&A process. So basically that's one yeah. alternative. The other is the company comes to us, the multinational and, and uh, wants to buy into Brazil and say, I, I know who I want to buy. I want to buy that company in particular. And just I, I'm mandating you to, to engage with them and, and, and try to convince them to do the transaction. And, and as Pablo said- and is, it, is it hard to convince them to do the transaction? Depends on the situation. So uh, it's it, it's not something that you can do unless there's a reason, right? So it's not that we, because of our own uh, weights, are going to convince them to sell if they are not willing no, to sell. So, Mar Marcio and Pablo are the <laughs> sales wizards that you create the narrative that is like everybody's going to fall in whatever you suggest, you know? Look, we, we have some examples of, of, uh, of uh, transactions in the buy side that we scouted the industry. And we identified three candidates and that we got the information of every candidate and they, they chose one and we finished the papers and everything was fine. And they decided not to do the deal, the sellers. So, uh, ah. you know, it's, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. Until the money has been transferred and then you can, you exactly can, then you can right. take as a boutique a little breath and maybe open up a beer as a celebration that finally five, seven years of, of work was paid off. Let it's, me it's tell you long, that I don't want to modest, but it's more rewarding. The money is also rewarding, but it's such that it's so rewarding to see that you finalized a project of one or two or three years and that people are happy and that they got their money and everything that you say, it's a, it's a great experience. And I, I love those moments of, of closing because of that. You know, yeah. it's, it's pure adrenaline that, and it's that, pure joy. That, that, that's a wonderful moment for us. I think it's the best moment is when you're closing a transaction. And, and unfortunately, because of the pandemic, uh, we are now closing more transactions virtually and electronically than, 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 than before. Before it was, uh, you were in a meeting room and somebody was signing papers and <laughs> many different versions, like uh, several copies of the same document, people around the table signing, and then after that, some sh champagne, right? Nowadays, you just go into a, a Zoom meeting and and <laughs> everybody's in Docu agreement, sign, Docu that's sign, it. Docu everything sign, signed, that's it, that's it, the yeah. money's transferred. Okay, done. <laughs> true, true. It, then, then how about... Basically, there is a lot of a lot of questions, and and of course, this type of a uh, 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 transaction moment can be life changing for for entrepreneurs, their families who've been hustling and grinding. Because most of the entrepreneurs who are doing business, they're just absolutely nuts. You you they're not going to most of the people who are who are creating businesses are not making money. If you want to make money, it's going to be just a lot easier to go and work for for a larger corporation. It's going to be guaranteed paycheck. You invest that in S and P five hundred, and you just sit on that top of that money and be patient, and you will become relatively wealthy if 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 you so have the means and the capabilities and the opportunities to do so. So creating these businesses uh, is absolutely nuts. Then these type of you know huge liquidation moments are a lot of the times the entrepreneurs are dreaming dreaming about and as you now both mentioned Pablo and Marcio even though Marcio last year you had three out of five where let's say basically buyers coming to you but a lot of the cases it's the entrepreneurs that come to you and say hey here's a mandate we need to liquidate they they want to like a little breathing room they have maybe got a heart attack uh because of the stress that they've been struggling throughout the years and and it's just not healthy what they're doing and they come to you hey please save us and we need to breathe um what is this like process? Like these, these are the moments that entrepreneurs are really dreaming about. What do you, what would you advise or say and share 
especially this humongous young generation entrepreneurs that are, are having these big dreams? What, what, what needs to happen that they can sell the company? So what needs to be done that they can sell the company? Okay. Uh, first of all, not necessarily people that sell the company are have companies that, that they don't earn money or that they are in trouble. No? Many times, uh, or most of the times, at least for family company, for family-owned businesses, is just they don't have the the descendants that want to take over the company or they're getting old and, uh, you know, they want to they wanna close everything, you know, their, their lives. And um, it's, uh, in, in that point in time, we advisors are like psychologists for these guys. It's very important to, for them to understand that there's a life after, you know, um, selling the company and that they will have a lot of free time, which they don't know how to administer. And yes. uh, this is something that we, uh, that we talk to potential sellers right at the beginning. What are you going to do afterwards? What you, what, what, what's your lifestyle? What, what do you, what you think you're going to do afterwards? No, because this is, this is not an easy moment. We have numerous examples of, of people that, you know, can get depressed after they sell the companies and they come to you and say, what, what should I do now? You know, that in, in a, in, in a way that what, what would you basically advise for, 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 you know, is this going to be, let's say tech entrepreneurs or, or family owned businesses and entrepreneurs overall, or now it's the second or third generation of, of businesses that they're running, um, when they want to sell. What, what what needs to happen in order to be able to put things together in order to sell it? Because the preparation works internally also happens that is actually sellable. Not everything, you know, is is the market does not desire. So what are the things that you would, you know, can you share a little bit of, of these things through your experience of multiple years of experience over two decades? That what needs to happen and how long you should internally start the preparation work to put the things internally in order? There is nice enough package that somebody says, heck yes. It's very important what you mentioned because you cannot go and sell out a company immediately, usually. No, you have to check what they are doing. If they have employees or, or everything in order or not, if they have all the sales, if the revenues are registered, if, you know, many, many, many details that you uh, get to know when you interact with, with, with the sellers, you know? So in, in many times we, we end up saying, okay, let's do this process. Let's put this like that. Let's, let's arrange this, this way. And let's see each other in six months mm -hmm. and let's start the process six months from now, instead of doing it today, no, uh, because you don't want to, to show some stuff that it was that is not convenient for this, for, for, for the sale, no, not that you are hiding anything, but to show that you are doing the, the things from now on in this way. Yeah. No? There's, there's, there's not much to that hide, to be honest, because the auditors will come in and we will check five years, uh, backlog. So the, the, it's, it's not that you can hide things. You don't hide things. And in fact, you show things to have the confidence with the buyer or the seller that you are showing them uh, specifically uh, what's, what's going on with the company and that you are not selling, you know, uh, uh, false, uh, uh, false things, false uh, ideas. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. It, it's a process. It's something that you have to be proactive in terms of the way you conduct the sale process. Sometimes when we are having the first conversation with a business owner, and we are pitching the idea of uh, the, them selling the company. Sometimes, at least here in Brazil, they tell you, okay, you come with the buyer and then I'll, I'll give you the mandate to sell. And it's not the way it works. So basically, we have to explain to them that we are going to be along their side, helping them conduct a process which is very complex and which they do not, do not know all all the traps that are along the way. And so we're going to be guiding them and helping them reach a broader audience of potential buyers and maximize their value by the way we conduct the process in a very proactive manner. 
So, yeah. um, and so the first thing we have to go through is to convince that the owners that we are not brokers. We are not there to just make two parties meet. We are there to advise them on how to, to sell the companies. And the point that Pablo just made is very important because I think uh, for entrepreneurs that, or even company owners that are listening to us, I think the most, one of the most important points is to have the company clean. So basically, if you're yeah. running the company, you know, if you're paying your taxes correctly, if your uh, your employees are uh, according to the labor laws and everything else, that helps a lot in a very critical phase of the process, which is the due diligence phase. Uh, and he, recently, we had a transaction here. Uh, it, unfortunately, it wasn't me. It was one of my partners, which was completely clean. So basically... After two months of, of due diligence work, the auditors from the buyer just said, and we were on the sell side, uh, the auditors of the buyer, okay, there is very small amount here, difference in the inventory, so uh, it's not enough to, 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 to discuss. So let's move ahead without any, any uh, major discussions of escrows and, and, and indemnification. So basically, let's go ahead and, and close it. So it's very rare. In my my whole career never happened to me. Look at that. <laughs> and it happened to yeah. Never. 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 There's always never. a big discussion and it, you spend a lot of time negotiating. These are the points that you spend most time negotiating besides price, which is actually negotiated at an earlier stage of the process. At the end of the process is when you're negotiating the escrow accounts, uh, escrow mechanisms and the indemnification limits. Uh, reps and warranties, everything that's related to contingencies and potential liabilities. Yeah. In terms of price, do you see a bigger disparity today compared to a couple of years back, given that there was this boom uh, in 2020, 2021? Do you see a big disparity between sellers and buyers or not? Any, any weird yeah, I, I think, fluctuations in there? Yeah, there's... Um, there are three methodologies that we use to value a company. One of them is discounted cash flow, which has the advantage of being uh, very tailored to that specific case. So it reflects the growth potential of that particular target, uh, that the company that's selling, and it also reflects its profitability. The other methodologies are multiple based, meaning we look at uh, precedent m and transactions, so transactions that happen uh, involving companies that are similar to the one we are valuing. And we also look at publicly traded comps. So companies that are uh, listed in the market, listed in, in, in stock exchange, that are similar to the ones that, that, that we are valuing. And if you look at that particular methodology, if you look at Brazil, for example, the discount today is very large. So uh, we are probably, if you look at overall, the overall market in Brazil, and there are uh, things that are not exactly comparable to the U.S., but for example, the, the discount between the S&P 500 and the, the B3 index is probably in the range of 50% today. So that's a very huge discount. Historically, it's been like 30%, maybe 25% because of the country risk, basically, right? Uh, so it's natural that Brazil would trade Brazilian companies of a similar business would trade at a discount to the U.S. counterparts or peers. But today, the discount is huge, especially after the pandemic. The markets have not uh, evolved uh, similarly, and the valuations in the U.S. are very high. And here, they basically kept the same. So basically, uh, the discount today is very large. And does that mean that you are seeing... A lot of appetite for um, buyers coming in. Yeah, we, we saw last year, uh, we, we had a, an increase in buy side activity. But, but it, I would say that uh, there are other factors that play an important role here in terms of the appetite. One of them is the political situation, obviously. Uh, for example, we had the transition of government from last year to this year. Uh, and in the first quarter of this year, we had a, a slowdown in M&A activity because of that. People were just waiting and see. So the international buyers were a little bit on the sidelines, uh, waiting to see what would happen, how would they will 
uh, demonstration uh, behave. And after that, in the second quarter, M&A activity starts to increase again. So things are moving. And we think the second half of this year is going to be better than the first half and then maybe 2024 even better. Hmm. And then, then basically on this, that it, 2024 may be even better, a lot of, especially if we now focus on, on, on a little bit on, on the tech side of, of, of things, one of the big things and the arguments and the narrative basically exists is that there is not enough venture money coming into the region um, that people are hoping. There's still very nascent technology ecosystems. Overall, it's, it's growing and growing at a very rapid pace, but people are saying that the biggest problem is the lack of exits that basically makes foreign investors afraid of the market to put venture dollars into the companies. Um, how how do you see this? Um, is 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 where is this heading? It's especially in in, in technology and and venture back companies. Are 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 you expecting more exits, or are the companies ready to be exited, or what, what are you seeing? And when would you say that the exit market may really take off um, in 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 Latin America overall? Yeah, or in your home market. Uh, first, we need to understand that the M and A market and venture market are very different in terms of. Uh, exits, right? Uh, first, on on the the M&A, the the actually the private equity market. Private equity market, you're looking at two alternatives, which is M and A or IPO for the exit. Mm -hmm. Either you sell the company to to another strategic buyer, which is a competitor usually, or you go to the IPO market. On the venture side, uh, because of the size of the companies, because obviously venture is an earlier stage of the corporate history, right? You, you, either you, you are growing and, and you may end up reaching a private equity stage and then IPO, you're growing a lot or you may not grow that fast. You don't have the alternative to go to, to an IPO, usually for most venture companies, right? Because for, to do an IPO, you have to have a minimum size. I would say that in Brazil, yeah, and, and we don't do IPOs, so basically that's based on, on an overall opinion, but I would say that for you to be able to do an IPO, we need to have at least $200 million of offer, So, which is a lot. To do that, your company needs to be value at least at that level. So for venture companies to exit, uh, they tend to, to exit uh, through sales to M and A to other players, right? So basically, it's a different logic. And venture capitals know that venture cap capital funds they they basically know that they're investing, you know, they invest in twenty companies, and they know that one of them will be very successful and will will go through the sort of corporate ladder and, and reach private equity stage and eventually IPO stage, but the other nineteen may not some of them will may be uh, okay but some of them most of them will fail while the private equity side is a different game in the sense that they don't yeah. want to lose principal amount uh, and they want to have a 25 percent return on their investment so uh, it's a different story so basically uh, the the exit for venture is is more geared towards m a not really ipo Unless it's a very yeah. successful story. I totally agree with Marcio. These are two different businesses, no? Um, mm. And uh, the risk that VCs are taking is much higher than, than, the, than the private equity risk. So Agreed. And, and, but do you see that now you've also, Pablo, like handled and you know tech entrepreneurs in Argentina. And, and it, it, even though whatever the, the volatility of Argentina is, there is a lot a lot, a tremendous amount of fantastic companies in terms of technology, what they're building, they're selling on a global scale. I mean, you've been executing some deals of, of helping these type of technology companies selling their 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 firms into bigger players, et cetera. Uh, do you see that these these volumes will increase um, in Argentina in terms of technology landscape? Are the tech entrepreneurs, can they expect more uh, um M&A money coming in and, and people are ready to buy these companies or 
what could be the limiting factor why why people are not buying because technology levels are very very solid the products that they're building the teams that they have very very good stuff yeah teams are here employees are here the technology is here but uh, the, the the deals i help to sell i would say they were not vc deals those are mm -hmm. deals those were deals much bigger than than venture capital no these are not guys putting yeah, yeah. Uh, two million dollars or five million dollars into a company to grow no these are different this is this is a different animal these guys were already big and they were already yeah. uh, uh, they had they had the profitable and you know that's how it works so the deals we do in m a basically these are bigger companies yeah um this is a different different world we we don't we don't take mandates of very small companies for sale. No, we can help them raise money, but not you know, not to, not to sell them to, to to someone else when they are very very small and they haven't they haven't have the the, the appropriate size. What would you say this is the appropriate size? It depends. It depends maybe on the need of the buy side. No, because many many times people need uh, com need to uh, companies need to buy other small smaller companies that have different technology that have some product that they need that or, or they are in some market that they are not so the, this is this is all over the place true this is all over the place then let's say a final theme or final question before we end this this great session we could go on forever and forever there's so many things about m a that that people want to know but now personally for you pablo and marcio if you would be able to share a little bit of the best deal and the worst deal you've been involved in your m a careers <laughs> you can be you don't need to share necessarily all the names but it would be as much as you can and you feel comfortable to share but this would be fascinating to know so the best and worst that you have been involved and then a little bit you know going under the hood and then explaining why for the worst, mm. I know it. <laughs> you know it. it. Go, go it ahead, Pablo. You can start then. <laughs> yeah. It was this buy side uh, uh, Monday that we had that we executed tremendously well that we got these companies that they needed to. It was a foreign company, a big foreign company, uh, willing to get into the Argentine market. And uh, we had the documents done we had the documents signed look at that and it was just a question of waiting i think it was six months to see if some tax law passed or not in order to see if they were going to escrow some more amount of money or not oh no no the contingency was going to go away if this law passed and in in this term that we were waiting we were having the champagne in the freezer, um, something happened with the com with, with our, the, the company that gave us the buy side mandate merged with a bigger company that was already in the country and the seller it decided not to sell because uh, they thought that this big company that was already present in Argentina was going to do bad things to their company, you know, or it was going to uh, fire everybody and they didn't want to fire the, their employees. Blah, blah. And so it ended up uh, not going through. Goodness, so the champagne was <laughs> in the freezer or yeah. fridge and then you yeah. were just waiting and waiting and then this... How much time was it in Paula, in total? Oh, at least two years. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, I agree with Pablo. I think the worst deal is really the one that you cannot close for some reason. For some reason. Uh, and there are many reasons why, it, you know, and there are, they happen at different stages of the process. And the ones that are, that hurt the more are the ones that you have everything in place and almost signed. I, I, I actually I remember one case where it was, a company in Brazil in the tech sector owned by an Argentinian citizen that operated here in Brazil. And, and we did a process for them 
and we did it actually three times. Basically, we tried once, and and the buyer which we selected was a U.S. company, and the guys uh, changed their mind. The buyer changed their mind during the due diligence, and then we did it second time. Uh, I think it was a French company also changed their mind in the due diligence. And finally, we ended up with a, a U.K. company, uh, you know, also not a startup, but, you know, a tech company growing in, 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 in the U.K. And we had all the documentation ready. Uh, it was ready for signature. And on the day of the signature, we received a message from, from the buyer saying, we were doing an offering at the AIM, which is the access market in the UK. And um, unfortunately, the offer was not uh, oversubscribed and it was a reduced size. And we had uh, raised more, less money than we wanted. Uh, and we were looking at two transactions, one in China and one in Brazil. And we decided to do the one in China. So basically, our transaction fell apart like in the last minute after the documentation was wow. ready for signature, and that that's usually the one that hurt hurts the most. Uh, as far as the best deal, it's usually the one that you make the most money the faster. Which in my case happened to be that uh, power transmission line that I talked to, which was my largest transaction, not the largest nine hundred million, nine hundred million, and it was not the largest fee. Because I had a smaller transaction, we had a, a larger fee, but it was my largest transaction uh, as a boutique. And the good thing was because it was a sector that's old economy, like energy power transmission, it's a regulated sector. So basically, there's no discussion about you know market share and and marketing strategy and products and growth. It's your Leasing the power transmission line to the government, there's a price that's corrected by inflation. Your contracts are usually the same, corrected by the same index. There is no mystery there. Uh, and it's a 30-year concession. So basically, it's very easy to model. So we went quickly from the modeling phase to the negotiation phase, and we managed, and it was a record for me. It still is a record for me. We managed to close the transaction, to sign a transaction, Actually, in two months, it didn't close in two Look months. Look at that! Because, well, because, yeah. But but remember, sometimes there is a difference between signing and closing. In this case, it involved a a state-owned company, which was the buyer, and it could not buy a hundred percent or at not more than fifty percent of the shares, because it then would become a a state-owned company, and it could not do that. So we had to give them a long time between signing and closing in order for them to find a partner to yeah. finance the 50 plus one shares. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And because of that, it took like six months between signing and closing. But during that time, the document was already signed, negotiated. We didn't have to do anything. So basically, uh, it was a good transaction because from mandate to sign, it was two months. And, and, a reasonable... and it actually went through. And it, it went through. There was no... There were no 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 hiccups there. problems that no, came in, no. in the six month period no, no. of time. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. And then Pablo, like for you, the best best deal. It's very difficult for me to choose one because I made a lot of friends and met a lot of nice people in the obviously in those transactions that we closed. Uh, you know some of them, uh, which I appreciate a lot. And but uh, you know if I have to choose one, maybe. The cross-border deal we did with Canada through IMAP was was an, a nice experience there, uh, of of putting two teams, one the Canadians and, and us, uh, with joint pitches and uh, bringing them down here, and you know everybody we put our our knowledge and expertise in the local market. They put their expertise in the mining industry and in, in knowing the the, the the potential clients. And it was a Canadian company buying an Argentinian company. Or the the Canadian partner in IMAP, which is boutique like ours, we did this deal together. Yes. No? The Argentine IMAP plus the Canadian IMAP together we we joined pitch it pitched to, to this mining company in Argentina. Uh -huh. And uh, they, this was sold eventually, yes, to uh, to uh, 
to Akarea and SPV, a special purpose vehicle in the mining industry. But okay. And that's one of the beauty of, of the partnership in IMAP, which is we can reach out to our partners, which have certain excellence uh, centers, like depending on, on their expertise, we can access that expertise throughout the globe and, 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 and help them with our local transactions. And in fact, 30% of IMAP's transactions are cross border. Look at that. This is, this is being more done in, in Europe than in, in Latin America, but uh, this is a, a nice big Amazing. And then, gentlemen, just a very, very final, very brief question. How did it feel when you closed your first transaction in M&A in your own boutique? <laughs> you still remember that? What year was it? What m month? What day of it? How did it feel? Oh, it felt great. It was 2005. And uh, I remember everything about that day. <laughs> I, I was very young. Yeah, my, mine was 2001. And uh, it, it felt fantastic because it, basically what I felt then was uh, I was serving some clients uh, while I was working with Bear Stearns in New York. I had to fly down to Brazil for a meeting, one, you know, one hour meeting. I had to fly down, participate in the meeting and come back. So obviously the clients don't like that. Basically they like to be served locally. And if they want to have a meeting last minute with you, they want to be sure you are able to participate and not pay top dollars to fi fly down some investment banker from New York. So basically when I came back to Brazil and decided to, f to, f to establish my own boutique, then I was able to service one of these clients, which ended up being my, my, my first transaction. And, I, and that felt great. I bet. I bet. Well, thank you very much, Pablo and Marcio. Um, I believe Baudista and I, I we, we learned a lot. And I, I think that a lot of the audience members are going to want to hear these things. And, and uh, we're going to get a lot of more questions from these. So maybe we will reach out to you and, and then, then get more, more thoughts. And we're going to pick up your brains more in the future as well. So thank you very much, gentlemen. With pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys.